moving on to our second half, we're going to stop on the midway through the Catholic issue. I know we've been discussing that for the past couple of weeks. For those of you, you know, who are may have downloaded an audio recording to this, you'll see where you know it went from Catholic to Christmas, and you're like, wait a second, the Catholicism thing isn't done yet. Well, we're going to come back to that later. But I really felt this was the perfect time to to pause that for a moment and go into the Christmas section. Not only because it's that time of year currently, because today's December eighth but also because part of what we're going to learn here in this Christmas section is going to apply when we get back to issues like idolatry and Mary and that kind of thing. We're going to understand those a whole lot better than if we hadn't covered this first. So, when covering the Christmas topic, and I titled, uh, for those of you who want to follow along, you can. I am not, as I am doing this recording, I am not, compl- I have not finished the Christmas article yet. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't spread that out to other people just yet until I announce that I'm finished with it. Because, and the reason it's already out right now and I can show you this is because it's, it's really, I, did, I, was, I planned on just doing a revision of it, but I basically removed the entire old article and redid this entire thing from scratch because there's so much, so much information on this. I, I could not just edit the old one anymore. <laughs> I had to redo it completely. And I guess it's a little embarrassing for me how little I actually covered this on the first time around, but I was, you know, I was just starting to learn about some of those things. And when we discuss, when I titled this The Rejection of Jesus, you're going to find out very shortly why I titled it that. There is a particular reason for it. And Christmas, the essence of Christmas, rejects the concept of Jesus Christ altogether. And we're going to find that out over the next few weeks here as we, as we cover this topic. Now, as a Christian... I will confess that I have had a love for pagan things. And let me make sure everyone understands what I mean. Uh, when, just like we've talked about in, in, in weeks past, when, whenever you, have, you guys look at a Christmas tree, you have a Christmas tree, it's got all these decorations, it's all lit up and everything, you get that warm, gooey feeling inside. And the warm, gooey feeling, you have to understand, is a connection to the childhood enjoyment you had at Christmas time. You had all the excitement of getting these new gifts, and of all these family members coming together, and everybody laughing and having fun, and there's lots of food, and you get to play with your new toys. All that feeling, that good time, happy feeling, you are linking to the Christmas tree. Okay, So really, what you're protecting when 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 I talk when I say anything about Christmas and there's going to be a lot of people that are going to to react viciously at me for talking about the truth about Christmas what you're really trying to protect are your childhood memories the warm memories you had as a child i am not stepping on your childhood memories what i'm trying to do is reveal the truth bring the light to symbols like the christmas tree Symbols like Santa Claus. What are these things? Where do they come from? Why do we, why do we celebrate this stuff? Okay. And for those of you who want to follow along on what we're going to read here, and those of you listening by audio, go onto our website. In the search bar, type in the word Christmas and press search. It'll it'll bring up an article called Christmas: The Rejection of Jesus. Now, when I say I've had a love for pagan things, I I all I too have gotten that that warm gooey feeling at looking at that stuff. So I have had a love for pagan things, and it is okay that we have liked pagan things. But that doesn't mean it's okay for us to deny their pe- the pagan origin of them. Okay, Just because you have celebrated Christmas does not mean you were not saved by Jesus Christ. Okay, Just because you have celebrated Halloween doesn't mean you are not saved by Jesus Christ. But the problem I have is that when I, when I talk to Christians about these pagan holidays and why, what, where they come from and why they're actually celebrating them, they deny the pagan origin. It's not that they... I have never had really Christians come and say, hmm, you know, I do celebrate that, but man, you are making some really good points. That is pagan, isn't it? But I'm, I'm going to continue to celebrate it anyway. No, that's not what they do. They try to justify themselves. Why? Because they want very badly for that pagan holiday that they love so much to have a Christian representation. They really very badly want that all that connection to have been... Uh, founded in the Bible. They, they want that. But the fact of the matter is, when, they, when it's revealed that it's a pagan origin, God immediately starts convicting the saved Christian. That's why they reject what I'm writing here so much. It's not that what I'm saying is not biblical. I have plenty of scripture in here to back up these arguments. 
I have plenty of documented book references from Wicca organizations, witchcraft, spell books, all sorts of stuff to back up what I'm saying here. They're not rejecting it because the information's bad. They're rejecting it because they, when I attack this, this these, the Christmas trees and all the decorations and, and everything like that, when I attack that, that stuff, they are making a direct connection between that and their childhood, so they feel like I'm stepping on their childhood memories. And that's what we need to, as a Christian, back off from our emotions and how we feel and have God humble us so that we, we can learn the truth of his word. Because it, what, is, what, is prim, what is the primary foundation of our beliefs? Is it our feelings? Are we like Mormons that go walk around saying, oh, we need to, we need to get the feeling in the bosom? That's when you know you've got the truth. Are we, are we walking around like a cult, like the Mormons, to where we're supposed to base everything on our feelings? Or do we hold the word of God as our foundation of truth? And that's what I want every Christian to, to consider before continuing to listen to this kind of thing. Okay. Now, everything, I mean, I, I, well, maybe I won't say everything. Because there are a couple of instances I'm still doing some research on to see if I can... If, if there are some pagan background to some of these things. I, there are a couple things I think are questionable. But most everything, down to the minute detail about Christmas, is pagan in origin. It's part of witchcraft. And I, really, I was, as much as I knew, when I started researching this, I found out more than I ever knew before. And I was honestly shocked at some of this. And I think some of you will also be shocked at some of this when you hear it. But this Christmas celebration is 100% evil. And I, I pray that the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy, with the Holy Spirit will give you conviction about some of these things. Because I don't, we have to understand, and I, I know I'll get more to that later, there are seducing spirits, there are doctrines of devils that we make ourselves vulnerable to when we, put our, when, we, when we start building up all these pagan decorations and bringing these things into our homes. You, you guys were with us when we, were, we talked about the Halloween issue. And we, we learned that, un, uh, even unknowingly, by doing certain things, participating in certain uh, Halloween events, we were actually practicing witchcraft. And that itself will bring seducing spirits into your home. There is an unseen level of this that I think a lot of Christians are unwilling to, it's not that they don't believe in the unseen spiritual battle. But again, when the Bible says that we fight against the princes and uh, principalities and powers, it's, it's the unseen that we are battling. And so it's not that they don't believe in the unseen. They don't want to believe that what they do is evil. They don't want to believe that the unseen is infiltrating their homes. And we have to understand when we're bringing these pagan things into our homes, we can invite seducing spirits along with them. And I want Christians to be protected against this stuff. I don't want to encourage you guys to go in and participate in witchcraft and then and have, you know, all sorts of things could happen to your home. When a demon comes into your home, you don't know what's going to happen. It could be causing sicknesses that you're unaware of. It could be affecting other people in your lives that you don't even know. Or, or no, other people in your lives that not that you don't personally know. I'm saying that you don't know what the demon is doing. You have no idea what that's causing. It could, be, it could be blocking you from learning some of the truth of God's word. It could, it could be blinding you. You don't even know what it's doing. But the fact of the matter, when you're inviting those pagan things into your home, there are consequences to that. That's all I'm saying. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25, it says, Wherefore, put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. So when I'm telling you these things, I'm, I'm simply doing what the Bible has told me to do. I'm trying to speak the truth every man to, to, ever, to all my neighbors, okay? I want you guys to know the truth. I'm not trying to ruin your fun. I'm not trying to say that you're not allowed to have fun. I'm saying that why do we have to have fun through witchcraft? What is the necessity there? And you're going to find out later that there are many Wicca books out there for witchcraft that are saying that celebrating this, because you, you'll find out later, I'll, I'll show you an example, you'll find out later that even psych, psychiatrists are saying those that do not celebrate Christmas have it have a disorder. I, I'm not kidding. They, I think it's labeled SAD, sad. You're, you're gonna, <laughs> it's so ridiculous. You're going to find out how corrupt this really gets. But Hosea 4.6, it said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. 
I mean, just consider that for a moment. It's, most of this is not really people who are incapable of learning the truth on this. It's people who willfully don't want to know. And that, that really uh, makes me concerned. I don't want Christians to walk around without the knowledge because they're going to leave, live cursed lives. They might destroy their own reward in heaven because they're rejecting knowledge. I don't want, I don't want Jesus Christ to reject you. Uh, we should not be willfully ignorant of things. We should be continually learning the truth in all matters of faith and practice. So uh, James chapter 5, 19 through 20, it says, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Okay? And so all I'm, all I'm doing is trying to convert the sinners away from error. Right? I am for, and I've said in this ministry for a long time, I am for truth and against error. I'm not anti-Catholic. I'm anti-error. And the Catholic Church is teaching error. Okay? If the Catholic Church would correct their errors, I'd be okay with Catholicism. But they're not going to. What's going to end up having to happen, if you're a Catholic and their doctrines bother you, you're going to have to leave their church. You're not going to change Catholicism. It's going to remain corrupt. But anyway, let's, let's continue on. Now, we just had learned in the past couple weeks in Catholicism what the Mass is. And you guys remember the Mass is a sacrifice. It's a blood sacrifice they're doing continually as a payment of sins to, to receive saving grace. That means they, are, they, are, uh, they believe that they're attaining eternal life by performing the Mass, which is totally against the Scripture. Now, the word Christmas in the Old English... Uh, I, I am not going to pronounce this right. It just it's Christus may say or something like that. I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Um, it's got some weird letters in there. I had to go look up the uh, the special characters to even make those. If, you, if you're reading those those little letters there, I can't pronounce that. I don't know Latin. It's kind of a dead language anyway. Um, and with and with the Catholic speaking it, it's kind of a language of the dead. Well, we could say that too. <laughs> some people are like, ooh, oh well, you know. Whatever. I'm just uh, play on words. Anyway, it means Christmas means Mass of Christ. Christ Mass. That's what the word is. Okay, it's it's completely a Catholic concept. The word Christmas, and and the uh, the pagans the the pagans and witches they don't they don't use the word Christmas uh, typically when they're celebrating. Okay, they do use it because now it's it's just kind of an acknowledged title, but that's not what Christmas was originally called. The celebration. Uh, now, the strange thing about this, this word mass in the Latin, mass means to dismiss. So when you literally translate mass of Christ, it means dismissal of Christ. Now, dismiss means to, to discharge or remove, to put away, put off or away, to put aside, to reject. So, you see, dismissal means to reject. Do you see how when I said that Christmas is the rejection of Jesus? It is the rejection of Christ. Now, we are going to talk to this a little bit, a little bit because one of the things I want to mention, I, I'm fully aware of what a Catholic will say to this. They'll say, no, no, you got that wrong. Uh, now, first of all, well, let me back up. Number one, a Catholic will typically not know how to respond to this. Most of them, and even because uh, when I was listening to um, a, a a debate from a guy, I cannot remember his name off the top of my head. He's got a ministry where he is trying to explain. Oh, here's what Catholics really believe, and he's trying to um, you know explain things to to non-Catholics about what Catholics really believe. Even though he started out his argument during this little debate saying that he is you know this is what this is what Catholics you know, the Catholic Church teaches this is what they should believe, and he, but he said, but a lot of Catholics are ignorant about this, and they don't realize it, so they're not really on, they're not really up to speed with what the Catholic Church believes, and so the guy he was debating against, the Christian he was debating against said, hey, so what you're saying, when you named your book what Catholics really believe, that's, that shouldn't be the title of your book, it should be what Catholics ought to believe, is that correct? <laughs> really kind of just hit him hard from the beginning because it's not what Catholics believe, it's what they ought to believe. And that's why I, I don't assume that every Catholic is going to know all this stuff that I, that I quote from the, the, like the Council of Trent and things like that. 
they, they don't know this stuff because a lot of them don't study it. A lot of them don't don't get to learn these things. Their priests don't tell them. So what happens? The first thing when they read something like this from my website, what are they going to do? They're going to go ask their priest about it or just say, well, I don't believe that. That can't be true. And then they're going to go to their priest and say, priest, tell me what this means. And I'm going to tell you what the priest is going to tell them. He's going to say, no, he has that wrong. Dis- the mass means dismissal because we are dismissing sins. Okay. Well, number one, for the phrase Christmas, that is not what that literally means. It literally means, Christmas literally means the rejection of Christ. So when someone says, Merry Christmas, they're actually saying, be happy on the day of rejecting Christ. That's what that really means. And why, why the phrase, Merry Christmas, is so abhorrent to me now is because of that. It's, it's Catholic, complete Catholicism, and it's, it's really about rejecting Christ. Now they're going to say, but we're, reje- you know, we're, we're, we're rejecting or dismissing sins, because what they say is that, oh, remember we were given the keys to the kingdom, and, and, and we're, we're, di- we're dismissing the sins. But you see, the, what they're claiming as dismissing sins is in the Mass, and that is a blood sacrifice they're continually doing over and over, which is a complete abomination and rejection of Jesus Christ anyway. So even if they want to say, well, you know, no, the Mass just means we're rejecting sins or we're dismissing sin, it's still an abomination unto God because they're practicing the Mass anyway. The whole thing, the concept, no matter which way you want to answer it, is a rejection of Christ. And we're going to find out with the pagan origins of this that, uh, that none of it has anything to do with Jesus Christ to begin with anyway. So... Uh, and what we're going to find out also is that, and, and part of our study here, is that we're going to find out that the, the, the Christian churches are ignorantly giving reverence to the same false pagan gods that witches worship. That's what we're about to find out here. So, uh, but we're going to have to go back into some history and some background uh, to understand this thing completely. First, I'm going to quote Galatians chapter 4, verses 9 through 10. It says, But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, that's an interesting phrase. After ye have known God, or rather, are known of God. Remember when Jesus Christ, he said he was rejecting people that came to him and said, Lord, Lord, have I prophesied in the name? He says, depart from me, I never knew you. It's not about whether they didn't know who he was, but he never knew them. You see, a Catholic can know who Jesus Christ is, but Jesus Christ cannot know him because he doesn't believe on Jesus Christ. He's never really repented and come to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's really repented to the Catholic Church and come to the Catholic Church. That's why I've used the phrase churchianity. It's people, it's not instead of Christianity. It's not about Christ, it's about the church. That's why I use that phrase. But it's just interesting there, it's another phrase that says, rather, you know, it's more important that God knows us. And that's, I, I just think it's, but it's, it's still a mutual thing. I mean, we still know God and God knows us, but it's, it's more important that God knows who we are. And that's, that's, you know, just reiterated in Matthew 7 there. It's kind of an interesting uh, concept. But anyway, continue, continuing, it says, How turn ye against to the weak and beggarly elements? Now, he's, he's talking to those who have known God and God has known them. So us, us saved Christians. In Galatians chapter 4, Paul is saying, How ye again turn to weak and beggarly elements. What, what, do you, what do you mean, what weak and beggarly elements? What are they turning to? And he says here, he says, Whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. So he's calling this weak and beggarly in bondage. What are, what are they turning to? He says, ye, ye observe days and months and times and years. We are not supposed to observe days. And the new covenant here. Okay. Now, I understand in the Old Covenant, in the Old Dispensation with the Jews, that they did observe days. There were specific days God told them to observe. But in the New Covenant, we are not, we are not told to observe days. Right? There's, there's nothing that we are. Even the Sabbath day, Jesus Christ said, God made Sabbath for man, not man for the Sabbath. So even then, we're, we're still not, we still are not forced to... I mean, we do this once a week because it's, it's good for us to study once a week. I mean, I don't see anything wrong, you know, of, of doing that. Because technically, even, even Sunday is not technically the Sabbath day. It's from Friday night to Saturday night. But nonetheless, you know, blah, 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 who cares? It, the point is, is that we're not, we're not bound to that in the, new, in the New Covenant. So, 
we, we still have, I mean, Jesus Christ fulfilled the law and the prophets. So our adherence to him and to his doctrines is what, what we ought to be focusing on. And, but a lot of people say, well, wait a second, what about the Ten Commandments? Well, the Ten Commandments that we're supposed to be following are still in the New Covenant. If there's anything in the Ten Commandments, like the Sabbath day, that we don't have to specifically do, it's spelled out for us in the New Covenant. And it is with Jesus Christ when he talked about that. And so, at the same time, when you see, you'll see a lot of things spelled out, where it says, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not covet, those kind of things. Those are still in the New Covenant. Everything's really spelled out if you study, study it carefully. But anyway, continuing, that's getting off on another topic, but continuing. But it says, you observe days and months and times and years. Now, this is, some, this is a topic I haven't written about yet. I will in the future. But even birthdays are a pagan concept. And typically, what a Christian should be more celebrating is not the day of one's birth, but the day of one's death. Because the day of one's death is when we are finally separated from the flesh and as a spirit can go to be with our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the day we celebrate. It's not that we're, you know, going around and looking for death and people committing suicide. No, no, no I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about the day of death is the day we celebrate because we finally go get to, go get to see our Lord. But the day of birth, that's when we enter into the sin of the flesh. But yeah, that's what people are celebrating. And, and you'll find out that all instances of birthdays in the Bible were celebrated by pagan kings and pagan lords who were considered, you know, they themselves in their own countries were considered to be gods, or they were wicked people. I think uh, Herod is one of, I, if I remember right, Herod is one of those that, that celebrated his birthday, but Herod's the one that wanted to kill Jesus Christ. So all examples we have of birthdays in the Bible uh, there's no scriptural reason I can see why we should be celebrating birthdays at all. Because even if you stop and consider it, it is a very prideful thing. It is a self-centered concept. It's a, it's, a, it's a celebration that worships man. It really does. It bring, you know, let's bring forth all our gifts to, the, to this, this person. Let's honor him. And none of it's about the Lord Jesus Christ. None of it's about God. It's about worshiping mankind. And so that's something we have to take in consideration. I will write, write an article about that eventually. I just haven't done that yet. But I immediately, when I, when I start talking about this issue, I start getting called, uh, people call me a legalist. All right, and what do they mean by that? That means, oh, you're just, you know, you're just like the old covenant where everything has to be done to the letter of the law. Really? That's not what I just said a minute ago. <laughs> if everything was done by the letter of the law, I would expect every single one of you to have celebrated the Sabbath yesterday. I would expect every one of you to have uh, not started a fire at all. That means you can't use your furnace, you can't start a car. I would expect every one of you to not make anyone work, because you can't work and you can't make anybody else work on the Sabbath. Okay. So if anybody, any of you turned on a light bulb yesterday, you made people at the electric company work, so you're not allowed to do that. There is nobody on this planet that keeps the Sabbath. <laughs> maybe the maybe the Amish do. That's a possibility, but even that's questionable, especially around here, because in the winter time, you got to start a fire. Well, how do you how do you <laughs> how do you deal with that? You know. So, anyway, on the Sabbath, there's supposed to be no work done. You see, I'm not obviously I'm not a legalist. You guys can testify to that, but they call me that. Why? Because they need to attack me as an excuse for them to hang on to their pagan lust. It, they think if I attack him, then I am justified in the wicked actions that I take. I mean, of course, that's what's, that's what's known in debate as an ad hominem attack. That's an attack on attacking someone's personal character. And technically, because remember we just read the Bible about a person that slanders, I will not tarry in my sight. You remember we read that in Psalm? If you're going to call someone a legalist and it's not true, you're slandering that person. Well, the Bible says not even to let that person tarry in your sight. There's some food for thought. We should, we should consider that. Okay? These people that run out and they just start make a bunch of railing accusations, that's a person who's slandering. You should think about that. You know, that you're know, you not supposed to let them tear in your sight. And that, and that goes for not just someone that's doing it to you, but what if, some, what if it's doing it to another Christian you know? I mean, consider that as well. Anyway, continuing, Galatians 4.3, it says, Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Okay, so the Bible says that observing days, months, and times, it's the same as being in bondage of the elements of the world. That means the elements of the world 
when the when Colossians uh, Colossians two eight talks about the rudiments of the world, that's talking about the first teachings. Rudiments are first teachings. It's what you get. The rudiments of the world are the first teachings of the world, and, and this is the same thing as the elements of the world. What the world is made up of. When it's referring to that, when, it's, when it talks about the world, there it's referring to that specifically. And so, what brings us into bondage? Observing these holidays that we're observing, these times and these days and these months. When we're observing these things, it's bringing us back into the into the world. And that also made me think about Thanksgiving. I started thinking about that. I was like, wait a second, maybe Thanksgiving is not all what I thought it was, because we're observing times, we're observing days. So I'm going to have to rethink that on Thanksgiving. I said that the other day that you know Thanksgiving is probably the only holiday I could consider Christian. Uh, I said that on a Facebook group post one time, but now I'm starting to rethink that because I said, wait a second, this affects everything. So I'm not really sure what position I take on that yet. Um, maybe in the future I'll do some more research and find out some information on that, but we, we will see in the future. Um, for now, I, I'm just saying that Thanksgiving, in, in terms of origins, is the only holiday I could consider that, that has any Christian uh, relevance to it whatsoever. Uh, but continuing in Galatians chapter 5, 1, or chapter 5, verse 1, it says, A stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. All right, we're supposed to bring ourselves into the liberty of Christ by following his doctrine. And it continues and says, And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. But what everybody keeps doing is going back to the yoke of bondage. And bondage is not just going back to the old, just like, you know, example of, of tithing, where you're going back into the yoke of bondage. Tithing is, is an example of that. When people are teaching the Old Testament uh, law of tithing that was given specifically to the Jewish people, that is bringing people back into the bondage of the law, the old bondage. And the same thing with pagan traditions of holidays like this. It's still bringing back people back into the yoke of bondage. Okay? And again, the Bible says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Well, all the unbelievers of the world celebrate Christmas. Why are, you, why are you so equally yoked together with them and what you're doing? All the rest of the world has their Christmas trees. Why are you so equally yoking yourself together with the unbelievers? Food for thought. Mark chapter 7, verse 13, it says, Making the word of God of none effect through your traditions, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. The Bible says through the traditions, there are many, many traditions we have, we are making the word of God of none effect. How can you preach the gospel properly while doing pagan things at the same time? Because if you're doing pagan things, paganism is a concept of worshiping multiple gods. How can you teach the truth of the true living God when you're doing things that are, that are built in honor and reverence of multiple false idols? More food for thought. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what it is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Not our own will. We prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we're not supposed to be conformed to this world, but yet many of us do by the things we bring into our homes. So to, to begin to understand the abomination of what Christmas really is and why the, abom the, the specific abomination of Christians bringing this into the church of Jesus Christ because they bring it into the church every year all the time. We need, we got to understand its origin. So we're going to look at a, an old pagan celebration called Saturnalia, which many of you have probably heard of before. But we're going to look into some details of what exactly this is. This is a quote from a book called The Christmas Compendium. And it says, quote, on, on 17 December, each winter, ancient Rome would erupt into a wild party called Saturnalia that lasted seven days. It was in honor of Saturn, the god of agriculture, from whose name we get Saturday. This day in September was the winter solstice, and the belief was that this showed spring was drawing near, and so the god of agriculture growth needed to be honored. As the Saturnalia returned each year, it brought with it thoughts of peaceful reign of Saturn long ago when all people were happy and good, end quote. And as you're going to see, as we, as we study this time of year, everything is focused about people getting, getting their happiness and joyful feeling no matter what they have to do to get it, just go get your happiness and your and your and your good feel good whatever you have to do. Okay, it's all about the emotion of the situation. But it was a wild party, and we will discuss later what that wild party really was, and the and the details of it. Uh, but it was in honor of the god of Saturn. 
the god of agriculture, and and he is related to the to the uh, as a god of agriculture, but also as a sun god. We're going to find out in in later quotations. There are a lot of people think, okay, here's the name of this god, and this is the only god it can represent. Wait a second, in paganism and witchcraft, you have to understand that the name of one god can also be applied to many many different concepts of that god. A, a single god can have many, many different names, and we're going to find that out later. Now, this uh, pagan... Just, oh, I'm sorry, go uh, ahead. Just to add on to what you got to point, when it comes to, like, just, uh, for instance, when it comes to, like, Greek mythology and Norse mythology, and even what the Romans believe, all the gods, you know, they line up, you know, they have all different names, but specifically they know to them are, like, really, really similar characteristics of what they do. Yeah, uh, you're right. Odin being a father, Zeus being a father. Uh, mm-hmm. And Rome, I forgot who the god of Zeus was, but they all, like, like really, really just close and not much each other. It's like, you can go to one mythology and then basically, like, connect them because basically their gods are pretty much the same. That's right. Yeah, you're absolutely right on that. And one of the things, I don't want to skip too far ahead of myself because we are going to get to that too. And we're going to give some examples of that. But you need to understand that Babylon was the first world government. You guys remember, remember if you remember uh, reading in the book of Daniel, and we're going to get to Daniel eventually. I don't know how long it's going to take us to get there in our Bible studies. But when, when you read in the book of Daniel, you talk about the, uh, the statue where he prophesied all the, these world religions that were kind of coming to play. And Babylon was the head of gold. It was the first major kingdom that no other kingdom would be like Babylon. Okay? And Babylon, it passes on the pagan concepts it originally created. And now most people, when they think Babylon, they think Nebuchadnezzar, but Nebuchadnezzar was only one king. Okay? <laughs> there were others. And Babylon really is the starting point for a lot of the paganism. Now, I don't want to say it's the starting point for all of it. Okay? Because I, I firmly believe there were pagan concepts before the flood of Noah. And that, that a lot gets into the Nephilim and discusses on that. But I, I mean, I personally believe some of that stuff. It's, I don't know that I could prove it scripturally. But the Bible does say there was, I mean, the thoughts of their hearts were only evil continually. I mean, I don't know how you can not have the thoughts of your hearts evil continually. and Or how you could have the thoughts of your hearts evil continually and still believe on God and not in pagan concepts. I don't know how you could disconnect those two things. So that's why, though it is an assumption, I think it's a very reasonable one that the, a lot of these pagan concepts were through that. And it's possible that some of those stories about what they did could have been handed through Noah and all that. But I, my belief is that even though there were pagan concepts before the flood, I think after the flood there were new ones. And it, But it is possible that some of those stories could have been passed through Noah and his family of what the people were doing before the flood, and some people picked up on this stuff and started and, and reopened it. That's that's a whole another discussion I don't want to get into right now. But Babylon, what you're going to find out is that Babylon is kind of the source of much of the paganism we have found in the world today. All these different names from these different countries that have called them different things, they're really referring back to the same god. And, and if you really study paganism out, you're going to find out that many of the god, there's actually only a, ha- a handful of them. And a lot of people think, oh man, there are thousands and thousands of these gods. No, there's really only a handful. And you're going to find out they represent the same things. Everywhere from, you know, India to, to Ireland, everywhere, there are many of these same concepts. So this pagan witch's wheel of the year that we see here. Now this one, if you guys were uh, following along with the Halloween article, you'll remember this one. And I, I, I put this back up here again because we need to, we're going to go through some of these as we talk about the different holidays. And so you'll see where Halloween, Samhain on October 31st, and then you've got December 21st is the winter solstice, okay? Now, they celebrate the eve of the winter solstice. So what they'll do is that they have the Saturnalia celebration, the Romans did, celebrating the, the winter solstice. It took place from the 17th through the 24th, and the smack middle is the eve of the winter solstice. So Halloween is All Hallows' Eve, and we have the winter solstice eve, that they that they celebrate. That's how they um, do that. It's similar to how people you know celebrate Christmas Eve into Christmas like that. And we'll get we'll get to those dates in a minute. But the holiday that the the pagans call it by the name of Yule. Now the name Yule will probably ring a bell to some of you. 
because you've heard the, the phrase Yuletide greetings before. And there are the, you, can, you can buy cards in the store that say Yuletide greetings on them, even today. That Yule is the pagan celebration that the Romans also called Saturnalia. And this is a quote from a, a book called uh, Cunningham's Encyclopedia of Wicca in the Kitchen. Uh, and again, if you guys remember me, I, some of you may not remember, but I mentioned um, Llewellyn when we were talking to, in some of our uh, Halloween stuff. This Llewellyn is, um, is a popular author of, of pagan and witch documentation. Whatever you see the, the, the name Llewellyn, and Llewellyn Worldwide uh, publishes this book, you'll see it, it, most likely it's pagan, anything that it is. That's, that's what they specifically focus on. So there's probably witches at the head of that publishing company. But anyway... This says, quote, Yule, circa December 21st, the winter solstice is an old solar ritual, remember that, solar ritual, that has been preserved in the Christian observance of Christmas. This holiday, a holy day, sacred day, astronomically marks the, the, wa the waning, or waning of winter. After the winter solstice, the hours of light increase each day. Therefore, Yule is associated with the returning warmth of the sun, end quote. So we've got the, the earth is on a tilted axis. I can't remember if it was, what, 21 degrees or 23 degrees, something like that. It's on a, a tilted axis. And, of course, everybody knows that the seasons change because of the tilt, the, the wobble of the earth. So as it goes to one side, it slows down and comes to a point stop where it stops going to one side. That one side is either the winter solstice or the summer solstice and then it starts to go back the other direction. Okay, So the sun in, in the northern hemisphere during the month of December, that's when we have the shortest days and that's when it gets the... That's, well, the shortest days, it's not necessarily when it's the coldest. The coldest, it usually goes into January and February and then it starts to warm up again. But the sun does start coming back. The days start getting longer after uh, the 21st. And that's what it's describing here. And this is, I'll read you another quote from a book called uh, Wiccan Beliefs and Practices with Rituals and uh, Solitaries and Covens. R Riches for Solitaries and Covens, that's what it says. And it says, quote, Yule is celebrated at the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year. Yule is the, is the Celtic celebration of the goddess becoming the great mother, giving birth to the god who died at Samhain the previous year. Now, we are going to talk about this later, but I, I want you guys to remember that. It's the Great Mother giving birth to the God who died at Samhain the previous year. It, the quote continues and says, It is celebrated as the sun returns after the longest night of the year. In actuality, the, the holiday of Christmas has always been more pagan than Christian, which is why many early Christians did not recognize it. End quote. So, this is, I mean, even the witches know that this is a pagan holiday, they understand, it, but Christians can't seem to get this. It's far more pagan than it has anything to do with Christianity. Here's another quote, because uh, Yule and Saturnalia both point to the same holiday, just so you understand this. And if for people who said, wait a second, that can't be true. Well, listen to this. This is from a book called uh, Sabbaths, A Witch's Approach to Living the Old Ways. It says, quote, The tradition of Yuletide gift-giving comes from Roman pagans who called Yule by the name of Saturnalia, a festival to honor the god Saturn, which is the sun god. And the, the early Roman explorers and conquerors carried this tradition throughout Europe where it remained part of the Yule celebration, end quote. So, and for those of you, again, who are following along, or if you may not, if you're listening to this audio, you may not be following along. If you want those references, just go to the website. Each reference is directly under each quote. You can read this all for yourself. Now, any Christian that's going to defend the, their love of their Christmas celebration, they're immediately going to point out that Christmas falls on December 25th, not the 17th through the 24th. Well, of, of course, you know, they're going to ignore the biblical warnings about observing days and times anyway, and that nowhere in the New Testament did the apostles and Christians celebrate birthdays, nor did Jesus give any commandments to do so. But I still want to address their concern. They're right, it's not on the 25th. So where do we get the 25th from? Well, we're going to have to go back and look at a little history here. And I know we won't be able to get through covering all this today, but we're, we'll get through as much as we can. Now, uh, I, want, I want you to listen to this quotation from this book. Quote, Semiramis was the mother of, and also became the first wife of, Nimrod, the king of Babylon. Now, did you hear that? In case you missed that, let me read that again. Just a little bit slower. Semiramis 
was the mother of and also became the first wife of Nimrod, the king of Babylon. You're saying, Chris, are you saying that she gave birth to a son and then married her son? Yes. Let's continue. The quote says, By virtue of his being, ki being king, Nimrod was also believed to be a god. See, and you have to understand that in Babylon, if you were king, you were, you were automatically considered a god. It's the same as the Egyptians done, and many, many cultures have done. You know, they consider the king to be a god himself. Uh, and the quote continues, it says, after, after Nimrod was killed, Semiramis, not willing to give up her power and position, and all, already being with child, declared that Nimrod had gone to commune with the other gods, and she sequestered herself away from the public eye until after her son, Tammuz, was born. So you have to understand, Tammuz, well, we'll get to that in a minute. We'll get to the family tree in just a minute. I'll, uh, I'll continue the quote. It says, she presented him as Nimrod returned from heaven. Semiramis was hailed as the mother of God and queen of heaven. December 25th, Tammuz's birthday, the day of his return, was cause for great celebration. Icons of Semiramis holding the infant Tammuz appeared in shrines everywhere. Her statues were paraded through the streets in celebration. These parades were common for gods from uh, Artemis to Zeus throughout the pagan world, and some even went on the road uh, from town to town. A great festive atmosphere with much drinking, singing, dancing, debauchery, and of course much merchandising. Does that sound familiar? Much merchandising always accompanied these events. Also along were the temple prostitutes, even the more common whores of the area, seeking to expand their commerce, end quote. So I want you to remember, Semiramis was hailed as Mother of God and Queen of Heaven. Remember that, because in a few weeks we're going to come back to that in some other teachings we're going to get to. But let's look at this family tree. Now Nimrod was not some sort of false person. A Genesis chapter 10 confirms Nimrod's existence. You can go to Genesis chapter 10, verses 6 through 8. It'll show you that Noah begat Ham. Ham begat Cush. Cush and Semiramis begat Nimrod. And then Nimrod and Semiramis begat Tammuz. Okay? So, yes, this woman had a son and then had another son through her son that she gave birth to. Okay? It's, this is a complete abomination of God, but this is what happened. She claimed... That this son she had, that Nimrod, okay, Nimrod was supposed to be the god of the sun, right? The sun god. And he, I've, I've read some sources that say he was killed by a wild boar. I don't know if that was true or not. That's, there's some stuff I can't, and there, I can't really document very well. That, that would be ironic, considering he was said to be a great hunter or something, but I find that funny. Well, yeah, but actually there's another testimony I read that said that um, one of... Noah's sons or grandsons actually came and killed him for his wickedness. There was another testimony I, I read that, that that's according to some older documentation that said that that's actually what happened. But I don't know. I don't, I don't think anybody knows for sure what exactly happened to him, but he died. Okay. And, but all the testimonies do say he was killed. He didn't like die of old age or anything. But Semiramis, and then there's also a speculation that it's possible Semiramis did not actually, ha that she was impregnated by somebody else, not Nimrod. That is a possibility, but I don't think that's the case. I think she really did. She got pregnant with Nimrod before he was killed. So a lot of that, some of that is, is speculation, but I, you know, I documented the best I could. But what happened is that any, any king of Babylon was claimed to be a god. And Nimrod, so he was killed. So to protect her son slash husband, which remember, her husband, Nimrod was also her son, Semiramis told the people that he left to commune with the gods. But he would return in another form, and she would bear him as a virgin. Now, I don't know how she was maintaining this virgin status when she gave birth to Nimrod himself. Unless, of course, she claimed that you know she had given him of immaculate conception too. But, she, of course, she wasn't a virgin. I mean, we know that. But it's unclear whether she was impregnated by Nimrod herself or somebody else. But anyway, this child Tammuz is supposed to be Nimrod reborn. So Nimrod and Tammuz are actually supposed to be the same person, according to pagan genealogy of their gods. Quote, Semiramis gave birth to another child named Tammuz, 
by her son Nimrod. While, she, while claiming she was a virgin, she maintained that she was the reincarnation of Nimrod. This was the foundation of the virgin mother with child archetype that Satan used to corrupt uh, the, the many world religions. Mary worship, the icon of the virgin with child, is derived from the image of Semiramis and her baby Tammuz by Nimrod, end quote. Now this is something to think about. Because what you have to understand is that the concepts of Catholicism have been pulled from pagan tradition. And the problem is that what the world does is they look at what Christians are doing today, and you see the atheists especially. They'll say, oh, you know, Christianity is just another mythological form of these things that the Sumerians and the, the, the Babylonians, they worshipped. Well, it's true when they're talking about Catholicism. And when they say Christian, they actually mean Catholic. So what happens is that so many Christians are fighting atheists on that, but what they really mean is Catholic, and the Catholics truly are worshipping a symbol that came, it's an icon that came out of Babylon. And we're going to find out as we study later, you're going to find out that there are uh, many instances in the Bible where Babylon is used as a code word for Rome. The early Christians used Babylon as a code word for Rome because you weren't allowed to, you know, talk anything bad about the Roman Empire or it was considered treason. So they used the word Babylon instead as a code word. Because it was bringing together all the world's pagan religions. And that's why Revelation refers to Mystery Babylon. That the woman riding the beast is Mystery Babylon. It's referring to Rome. The revived fourth, fourth beast that talks about in Daniel. That's a whole other topic we could talk about for a long time. But the point I want to get to is that what it, you know, what's significant about all this? What does this, any of this have to do with Christmas? Because Tammuz' birthday was December 25th. Ah. Now we're getting somewhere. The pagans worship the false god Nimrod, and then and then the same worship Tammuz. And we're going to find out in the Bible, the Bible does talk about people who are worshiping Tammuz. So don't consider that Tammuz is just one of these names often about somewhere. The Bible actually mentions it, and mentions that it's a complete abomination unto God. But they made a celebration of his birth that we now know is December 25th. So what are the Catholics doing? The Catholics wanted to celebrate the birth of Christ, so they moved that celebration to put it directly in line with the celebration uh, that, of Saturnalia, which is Yule, which the pagan witches were already celebrating. So they moved it into all one big celebration. Why do you think they moved All Saints Day to the same time as Halloween, All Hallows Eve? because they wanted to align all their pagan observing days and times that they were doing, they wanted to align it with the pagans to help bring the pagans into their already corrupted church. And this, this will start, once you really let this settle into your mind and start looking at the things that are happening today, this is going to start making a whole lot of sense of the things we see today in comparison to what we're seeing the Bible say. And when, when in the end times, when uh, it, Daniel talks about the end times, when there's going to be that final son of perdition come, the final Antichrist, and it said he's going to cause craft to prosper, there's a reason for that. He's talking about witchcraft. He's talking about paganism. And we're going to, we're going to see that grow stronger. We already, we already do it with Christmas. It's really easy to see how strong that has grown. You have statues and drawings uh, in worship of this virgin mother and her god, child, were made by the Babylonians. And of course, Rome adopted these things as this was passed around because there's all sorts of cultures that have this Samaramis and Tammuz. There's one of uh, Isis and I can't remember the, all the different names. I get, I get some of the names confused sometimes because there's so many different ones uh, to memorize. And, and the Bible says to learn not the way of the heathen, so there's not, I don't need to go memorize a bunch of them. But let me get this quotation. It's a book, a book about Christmas. Uh, the documents. It is, it's, it's actually called The Weird and Wonderful Christmas, Curious and Crazy Customs and Coincidences from Around the World. And it says, quote, In 350, Pope Julius I officially declared December 25th as the birthday of Jesus. Now consider the Catholic Church was officially made a church in 326 AD under the Roman Emperor Constantine. Then, in th uh, this quotation says, In 350, Pope Julius I officially declared December 25th as the birthday of Jesus. So this is roughly 25 years after the Catholic Church got started. All right? Immediately afterwards, they're already starting to observe days and times. They're already making it into a pagan religion. You can see what they're doing. 
it, this quote continues. It says, in 354, Bishop Lib, uh, Liberius of Rome officially adopted December 25th as the day to celebrate the birth of Jesus, adding the holy day to the Roman calendar. In AD 400, so this is roughly 75 years after, after their Catholic Church was started, in AD 500, Pope Sixtus III conducted the first midnight mass on Christmas at the church of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome, end quote. So nothing about this is Christian. This is all really Catholic, that Catholic sources that come from pagan witchcraft, and their Madonna and child symbol that they have, you know, with Mary and Jesus, this is simply an idol that was developed from Semiramis and Tammuz. And you know, they put this idol they put this idol in their church, and people bow down and worship it, and cry in front of it, and they and they and they and they kiss the feet of it. You have to understand, they're kissing the feet of a pagan idol. And this is this is very a very serious offense toward God. Now, I also uh, want people to consider that this symbol of Samaramus is is portrayed in different ways. A, a very common one is the Samaramus with the child Tammuz slash Nimrod. Okay. And by the way, whenever you have you guys ever heard the um, somebody call somebody else, well, way to go, Nimrod, and they use that as an insult. That's why they use that as an insult. Is because they they're it's it's actually a very um, sexually provocative insult because it's basically somebody who's dumb enough to marry your own mother. <laughs> that's that's the the insult that they're giving to that person. So if you ever, ever hear that, you got to remember this. This is where that comes from. So it's actually a very very powerful insult that a lot of people don't use very much anymore. But they used to be used all the time. But I, I put in a little note section here called "Searching for the Final Antichrist." And the reason I did is because Semiramis is still portrayed in a number of different ways in a number of different places, and she is often portrayed as holding a torch instead of a child because the torch is a symbol of the return of the pagan god of Nimrod. So technically in her holding the torch she would be pregnant with this child and she's holding this torch for this light, child of light, the sun god, to return. What you see is that this child was supposed to be a messiah child but as you can see of its pagan witchcraft involved with it, this is supposed to be an antichrist. And that today, we have symbols. The Statue of Liberty holding the torch is Semiramis, awaiting the antichrist, holding up the torch for this. The Columbia Pictures, when you watch a movie, and you know if you've ever been to a movie theater and they got the big Columbia Pictures thing that comes in with this woman holding this torch, standing on stair steps with this clouds behind her, that is Semiramis holding the torch awaiting the final Antichrist to come and give this revealed knowledge and truth to the world. And so I, I give some, some different examples of images on the website where that's happening. But this is more a representation of a Messiah child waiting for a final Antichrist, you see. Very interesting when you, when you start to uh, consider that. We're going to go over just a few minutes here today because we got started really late. But I just want to make a, a few more points here before we continue on next week. So... The worship of Nimrod, like Semiramis and, and Tammuz and all that stuff, the worship of all the all these people, because again, Semiramis claimed herself to be divine. Okay, that she was a divine female, a goddess giving birth to a god, in his reincarnation. All right, and uh, but Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz are are just Babylonian names that are used, but they're they're known across the world as different names. And uh, let me read you this uh, quotation from this book that talks about it. It says, Nimrod was worshipped in Greece under the name Adonis. The name Adonis, by which this deity was known to, uh, to the Greeks, is none other than the uh, Phoenician Adhan. And as we know, the Phoenicians are Hermetic in origin. Uh, that's, that's the topic of his book. The quote continues and says, uh, The name of the Phoenician deity the Adonis of the Greeks, he was originally a Sumerian or Babylonian sun god called uh, Demuzu. And you want to remember that because that's another name that, that, that goes by as well. The quote continues and also says, the husband of Ishtar. Now, that ought to ring a bell for some of you because Ishtar is where we get the celebration of Easter from. 
How interesting. This Tammuz and Nimrod sun worship carries over into Easter, and when we, in a few months when we get to the Easter celebration, hopefully I will have enough time to go through and do a whole uh, research topic and, and revise the Easter article as well. And we'll get into more detail about what that means. The quote continues, it says, The husband of Ishtar, who corresponds to Aphrodite, Venus of the Greeks. The worship of these deities was introduced into Syria in the very early times under the designation of Tammuz and Astar Astarte, and, and appears among the Greeks in the myth of Adonis and Aphrodite, who are identified with Osiris and Isis of the Egyptian pantheon, showing how widespread Babylonian cult became, end quote. So it's not like, you know, a lot of people say, oh, this can't be true. It's not like I'm making this up. I'm telling you what historians are even saying. They, they've they researched where the origins of these different things have come from. The pagans themselves understand it. Witches and witch covens understand this. Why is it that Christians can't seem to get a grasp on this? How blind has the church become? Many So we get to... Um, that many different cultures. Now, uh, for Semiramis, here are some other names Semiramis is known by. Venus, Kuan Yin, in, in Eastern culture, uh, Aphrodite, Ceres, Shingmu, Diana, Artemis, Astarte, Ishtar, Irene, Isis, Ashtoreth, and Mary in Catholicism. That's, that's the names that this god is known under. So when you see this happening, these are, I mean, it's really all worshiping the same false idol. But they're doing it in different, in, in, some, in slightly different ways, but under the same, mostly, most of the time it's under the same uh, context. And Nimrod slash Tammuz is also called by Osiris, Horus, and you guys remember the eye of Horus, all that stuff, the all-seeing eye? That's where that comes from is from the, the Nimrod Tammuz sun worship. Jupiter, Saturn, that's where we get the celebration of Saturnalia, is from Saturn. Adonis, Orion, Demuzi, or, De, or Demuzu, it's sometimes pronounced in two different ways. Bacchus, which uh, Bacchus we will mention later when we get to the study on uh, fantasy novels and the occult. We'll, we'll find what Bacchus really is, because uh, C.S. Lewis used a lot, he was not a Christian, he used a lot of paganism in his in his writing, and Bacchus is one of the ones he used. Apollo, Ra, Baal, you know all the, all the times in, in the Bible where they were worshippers of Baal, this is carrying on the Nimrod Tammuz sun god worship, Baal. And of course, Jesus is what he's called in Catholicism. Now, people, just because the name of Jesus is above every other name, but that doesn't mean that Satan can't take the name of Jesus and slap that name onto another label, or slap that name onto another, another false god. He can do that. Okay, That's why the Bible says, ye shall know them by their fruits. He didn't say, ye shall know them by every person that says the word name of Lord Jesus is automatically saved. <laughs> he says, you'll know them by their fruits. That's why he said, you have to go and look at more evidence before you actually decide who is really of God and who's not. And, it, of course, our decision does not is not the end ruling that God gives. But it, it, we are supposed to judge those matters. And again, Jesus Christ said that any, you know, he who is righteous judges all things. So we're supposed to judge these matters and have discernment in them. Uh, so when, when we go through this in subsequent weeks that we're studying at Christmas, you're going to need to remember some of these names because they're going to pop up. You're going to see it when I quote some of these textbooks, or, or not textbooks, but, well, some of them are Wicca textbooks. But you're going to see these names pop up. I'll give you one right now. This is this is called the book's called the Wicca Handbook. Okay, it was was published in two thousand eight. It was talking about a, it's how to perform a specific magic spell that they were talking about in here, and it lists the goddesses that you're supposed to invoke these names. It says here's the names you can invoke. It quote Aphrodite. I don't know how to pronounce this one. Kal Kihuitilku. I don't know what that is. There's Daedra, Erzuli, Hathor, Hebe, Helen, Ashun, Sarah, Semiramis, Venus, and Zaria, end quote. Now, of course, Semiramis is in there. You can see that Semiramis is listed under the same, just like Aphrodite and Venus and all those. It's listed under the same exact goddess that you're, that you're naming this. And the following is written by a practicing Wiccan priestess, and she's the author of a number of books on witchcraft. It says, quote, 
The goddess of the universe itself is not so, is something separate from or superior to, to it. The cre creation is the business of the universe, which destroys only to recreate. We personify this as the Great Mother. She is self-created and self-renewing. We share atoms with her, are one small part of the Godhead, but we, we are just one product of her. Great creative nature. Her variety is infinite as evidenced by snowflakes and fingerprints. She is the yin and yang of being, composed of both female goddess and male god energy. Now, before I continue the rest of the quote, notice what she's saying here. Just because you name a goddess or a god does not mean you could not be talking about the same thing. Semiramis, they could still be referring to a male god energy, because to them, it's both combined. So even if you're worshiping a god, a, a, like one god, like a Zeus or something like that, you still could be referring to the same goddess, great mother of witchcraft. To them, it's all the same energy. The quote continues and says, We worship her by many names, Ishtar, Isis, Shakti, Ashara, Zakequetzal, Bridget. And if you're further up north, they uh, worship Frigid. Sorry, small joke. Anyway, it conti quote continues. It says, uh, Pele, Copper Woman, Lupa, Luna. We also recognize old gods like Pan. Now, Pan is the satanic god that Aleister Crowley worshipped. We talked about that in the Christian Rock section. If you want, if anybody listening to this by audio wants to learn more about that, go, go look up the uh, teachings we did. You can download the audios in the Christian Rock teachings we did, and you'll get a lot more information on that. But it says Pan, Osiris, Tammuz, Jove, uh, Quetzalcoatl, this is uh, Cernunos, Cernunos you'll want to remember because that one's going to come up later, Cernunos, remember that one, we'll, we'll, we'll cover that here in a couple, in a week or two, Mithras, and worship them if we feel moved to do so, end quote. So pagans don't have a specific, you know, one that they are dedicated to, they're dedicated to them all really, because it's all supposed to be part of this same energy in the universe, the, the reason I tell you guys this is because I want you to understand the perspective of the pagans. Not because we need to learn all this stuff and memorize it. You don't need to memorize all this stuff. You just need to understand the perspective of the pagans. And when you understand the perspective of the pagans, you'll see how the Catholic Church is so corrupt. Because it's not really worshipping the same Christian God of the Bible. And so we have to understand there's a big difference between the Jesus Christ of the Bible, the Son of the true living God, and the pagan in quotations, small false god, the Catholic Church worships, whom they give the name, the label of Jesus. There's a big difference between the Mary of the Bible, whom God chose to be the virgin vessel through which he would enter the world in the flesh, and the Mary of the Catholics, which is a false pagan goddess taken from the tradition of heathen. And that's what I, I, I want people to understand as we're going through this. So we're going to get to um, some more examples of this later. And I'll, I'll, we'll continue on with this next week. I think we're going to stop right here. We will get some more some more specific examples on Christmas later, but we need to lay out this this foundation for us to 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 build this concept on, so we understand where all this is coming from. We have to understand the seed from which the tree has grown, this tree, this evil tree that we can't get good good fruit out of. Thanks for joining us again this week, and we'll see you next week.